Welcome. I'm sure many of you heard of Valentina Zarakova's solar cycle predictions saying that we are about to enter a new grand solar minimum and that will lead to a very cold temperatures and food shortages, in fact, at the oncoming of a new little ice age. This video is going to show why I believe those predictions are completely wrong. I have two basic problems with her work. The first is with the scientific modeling of the solar cycle. Don't get me wrong, this is perfectly good science. It was uh, published in a peer-reviewed journal. But at the moment you have to realize it is just a hypothesis, yet some people are treating it as though it's a proven fact. Based on previous hy hypotheses of a similar nature, it is likely to be wrong. I have a much bigger problem with her linkage of the, her solar cycle predictions to the possibility of a new little ice age. This is completely wrong. It is poor science and shows that she hasn't properly reviewed the literature and understood uh, what is said by the climate models. It reflects badly on her credibility of her other work. First, let's deal with the problem of the solar cycle predictions. Here you can see the solar cycles over the last 150 years. And you can see they look relatively regular, but that's not quite the case. The amplitude changes, and the timing changes in what appears to be a relatively random way. So the conundrum that solar physicists have had for the last 150 or 175 years has been how to predict what the next cycle will do. And so far to date, nobody has got it right. Now, what makes us think that Zarakova's new method has got it right? So what has Zarakova done that's different from other folks? She's applied a method called principal component analysis to the solar magnetic field and sunspot data. Well, what is principal component analysis? It's a way of seeing how spread out the data is in, in a minimum number of dimensions. So for example, here you could have uh, the uh, size of a solar cycle as a function of so solar cycle number or something of that sort. And you could draw an axis along uh, in one plane uh, and then that is called your eigenvector. And then you measure the distance from that axis uh, to get the eigenvalues for each point. So effectively what you've done is you've taken two-dimensional data and made it into one-dimensional data. And then you choose another uh, eigenvector uh, and do the same thing again. So now you've reduced this uh, plot to two linear uh, amounts of data. That simplifies it. Sometimes, for example, if you have three-dimensional data, you can reduce it to two using this, this method. So that makes it very things very simple. However, as one mathematician put it, it's a way of stopping non-mathematicians from asking difficult questions. Well, I'm not going to be stopped from asking difficult questions. Unfortunately, she starts off making a completely untrue statement. 150 predictions of solar cycle 24, only two predicted it would be lower than solar cycle 23. Now, I go into a paper by Dean Pesnell, made, written in 2015, which showed the distribution of solar cycle 24 predictions. There weren't 150, there were 108. And the, for solar cycle 24, um, the vast majority of them were lower than solar cycle 23, which I've marked here with a blue arrow. The sunspot number for solar cycle 23 was 116, and she predicted that uh, solar cycle 24 would be 80% of that, which equals 93. The actual number for solar cycle 24 was 80. So that represents a 16% error in the amplitude, not a 2% error, which she claimed. And remember, her predictions were made in 2014, after the peak of solar cycle 24. Most of these predictions were made 5 or 10 years before the peak of solar cycle 24. So these are actually true predictions. Hers was what's called a hindcast. And of all these predictions, 36 predictions were closer than hers in the amplitude of solar cycle 24. Well, let's examine her claim of 98% accuracy in a bit more detail. Now, I've taken the plot where she says she's converted her uh, principal component analysis into an equivalent of sunspot numbers, uh, solar activity. It's in arbitrary units, so we're going to have to be a little bit careful here, but nonetheless, we can still do something. So first of all, I decided to check the timing of solar maximum. So in the first case of solar cycle 21, she was indeed 98% accurate. We got that, nearly got that time perfectly. However, solar cycle 22 is a bit worse. It's only 89% accurate. Solar cycle 23 
is 83% accurate, and Solar Cycle 24 is 69% accurate. This does not look like a 2% uncertainty to me. And in fact, she'd have had much higher accuracy if she'd just assumed the standard 11.1 year solar cycle and uh, from starting from solar cycle 21. Now let's take a look at the amplitude. Now here we have a problem because these are arbitrary units. So I've assumed that her prediction for solar cycle 21 was 100% accurate. So how does that compare with the other cycles? So solar cycle 22 would be 81% accurate. So was solar cycle 23. Solar cycle 24 was 84% accurate. So again, we don't seem to be having a great deal of success in getting the amplitude or the timing of the cycles based on our own plot. Also, you would note that the time between solar cycle 23 and solar cycle 24, the solar minimum there, she claims is going to be quite a bit of solar activity. However, if you remember, that particular solar minimum was the longest and lowest on recorded history. So this is completely wrong. Similarly, she claims that solar cycle 25 should have been well underway by 2018, and it isn't as yet. So she's wrong there too. So I think her claim of 98% accuracy is very much over uh, emphasized. I think she has yet another problem. This time it's a 400 year problem. If you look at the output of her model, you can see that uh, there's a regular periodicity of about 400 years, which I don't quite understand how you can get that from just 20 years worth of data. But nonetheless, that's up to her and her mathematical models. As she claims that she can project as far forward or as far back as she likes with these particular models so that we can actually check this and go back and look at previous grand solar minima as indicated by the um, isotopes in ice cores and see whether her 400 year periodicity shows up. So here are the grand solar minima as determined from those ice core measurements. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to mark off 400 year periods all the way back through this time frame, uh, starting with the Maunda minimum. So I've lined up one of these vertical bars with the Maunda minimum and then stepped off 400 year gaps all the way further back. Now what we're looking for here is a prediction where the black vertical line corresponds to the middle of one of those blue dips. And as you can see, even being generous, only two of those grand solar minima correspond to anything like the prediction of her model. And she claimed that her model could project as far back or as far forward as we liked. Apparently, it doesn't work when you go this far back. It doesn't project any of the grand solar minima that we uh, see, except for probably by chance. So what can we conclude from all of these solar cycle predictions of hers? Zarkova's hypothesis could be, one, right, but we're going to have to wait for decades before we know. It could be right for the wrong reasons. The next cycle may be higher, the same or lower than the present cycle. So you've got a one in three chance of being right. So you're going to need several uh, solar cycles to prove her hypothesis right or wrong. And most likely, I think, that her hypothesis is going to be wrong. She claims an accuracy of 98% for her predictions. But you'd have got a better uh, prediction of the timing of the cycle by just assuming an 11.1 year cycle and by assuming the average cycle intensity over the last five cycles. The rate of grand solar minima is not every 400 years, as she seemed to have assumed, but it varies quite considerably. She's made exaggerated claims, like she was the only one of two people to predict that solar cycle 24 would be smaller than solar cycle 23. Yet, according to the paper by Pesnell, more than half of the um, predictions were for a cycle smaller than solar cycle 23. And remember, her predictions were hindcasts. She knew the answers for cycles 21, 22, 23 and 24 when she wrote the paper. And not to get a better accuracy on her results, is, shows that I think that likely uh, her method is wrong. Now in the second part we're going to examine her claimed link between solar activity and climate and this is the part that gives me the most heartburn. She did not mention anything about weather or climate in her original peer-reviewed paper, probably fortunately so because it probably wouldn't have got published if she had. Here's a graph showing the annual temperature of the earth over the last 140 years. 
compared to the sunspot number over that same time. Now the solid lines here are averaged by 11 years, so they're equivalent to the solar cycle. You will notice that since 1957, solar activity has been on a slow downward trend. Yet, during that same time, global temperatures have been on the rise, the exact reverse of what would be required to link solar activity with global temperatures. She also has a timing problem. If you look here, she's marked the little ice age down at the bottom and made it correspond to the Maunder minimum and the Dalton minimum. She's also got the medieval warm period here around about 1400. Now, none of these dates are right. The little ice age stretched from 1350 to 1850. The medieval warm period was from 950 to 1250. So all of those dates are wrong. Now the Maunder minimum was marked by this green arrow in here and the Dalton minimum is up here around about 1800 at a time when her model predicts that solar activity and thus the climate would be a lot warmer. So her model does not correspond to what we actually know about these warm and cold periods, making it yet more likely that her model is wrong. Okay, let's deal with the Maunder minimum myth once and for all. Zarkova says, during the Maunder minimum, the temperatures dropped, it was freezing, there were frost fairs on the Thames, as though that proved that there was a link between the two. What she is failing to mention, or doesn't even know, that the Maunder minimum occurred during the Little Ice Age, not the other way around. So the Maunder minimum couldn't have caused the Little Ice Age, so that's a non-starter from the very beginning. There were a total of 29 frost fairs recorded during the Little Ice Age, but only eight of them occurred during the Maunder Minimum. And the Maunder Minimum was not even the coldest part of the Little Ice Age, so this supposed link doesn't exist. Well, does the Dalton Minimum support her case anymore? I'm afraid not. There were two low cycles, solar cycle five and six. A lot of people have said, oh look, cycle th three was very similar to cycle 22, cycle four was very similar to cycle 23, and solar cycle uh, 24 is looking rather like solar cycle five. But you notice that they stopped that data in 2012. If you go forward, because we have another six years worth of data, that's what happened. So cycle 24 is nothing like cycle 25. It was much more active. Also, a lot of people like to associate solar cycles five and six with the Dickensian winters. The only problem is that the Dickensian winters didn't start until about 1849 when he wrote uh, The Christmas Carol. In fact, Dickens wasn't even born before the end of solar cycle five. Well, let's take a look at global temperatures. Here's uh, the modern record in blue and proxy record in green. So here's the Dalton minimum. And you can see there is a big dip in, in global temperatures at this time. The only thing is that that corresponds to two major eruptions of volcanoes. <clears throat> One was the Tambora volcano, which was the largest eruption in modern history. And volcanic eruptions are associated with drops in global temperature. Well, one question she could have asked herself, which apparently she didn't, is does the Earth cool when solar activity is low? Here are the last uh, six cycles, 19 through 24. And on here, I'm going to show you the dates of the 10 warmest years on record. Now note where they fall with respect to solar maximum. 2007, solar minimum, just at the beginning, 1998, just the beginning of solar cycle 23. 2009, solar minimum. 2013, well, that was near the peak of uh, solar cycle 24. 2005, in, late in the decay phase of solar cycle 23. 2014, again at the peak of um, the uh, current solar cycle. 2018, which is probably going to be the fourth warmest year on record, way down in the de uh, decay of solar cycle 24. 2017, similar. 2015 similar, 2016 the warmest year of all similar. So only two of those 10 years have actually been at or near the peak of a solar maximum. Most of them have occurred when the solar activity is really low. Therefore I would conclude that the Earth's average temperature is not significantly risen 
by the presence of a solar maximum and not significantly cooled by the presence of a solar minimum. She then makes another misleading statement that climate models only use TSI, total solar radiance that is. They're missing the main contributor, the magnetic field. Well, of course, the magnetic field does not actually affect temperatures. What she's actually talking about is the ultraviolet light that uh, is, can warm parts of the Earth's atmosphere, particularly the outer layers. However, the ultraviolet flux is part of the total solar irradiance. So it's not missing at all. She then moves on to talk about the uh, magnetic shield formed by the sun. This is what's called the heliosphere uh, and helps to prevent galactic cosmic rays from entering the solar system, although that it is a fairly leaky shield. She says the sun's magnetic field produces a shield to the whole of the solar system. True. And then she goes into the cosmic ray explanation. Uh, lower magnetic field, more cosmic rays, more clouds, cooler Earth. While this might seem uh, logical on the surface, when you actually get into the details of it, the physics of it, that isn't the case at all. First of all, there's been no change in the number of cosmic rays hitting the Earth. There's been no significant change in the number of clouds especially as the cosmic rays are absorbed at an altitude very different from the altitude which clouds form. And we haven't had a cooler Earth, we've had a warmer Earth. So that doesn't make any sense whatsoever. And then she said, well, to prove this, that we have melting of ice on Mars and ice forming on Jupiter. Um, aren't those two statements in contradiction with one another? If Mars is melting, then surely the ice on Jupiter should be melting, or vice versa. Actually, neither of those statements are true and are complete misreadings of the papers that uh, discuss these particular issues. Again, she hasn't really done her homework before she starts making these outrageous claims, which I think undermines the whole of her uh, arguments. Lastly, she appeals to the paper by Akasufu in 2012 and laughs at the results of the IPCC. She shows this plot, which if you look at the time between 2000 and 2020, we can see that the two plots diverge. IPCC shows a, a general upward trend, whereas Akasufu shows a downward trend. In fact, if you read the quantities off this graph, You'll see that Akasufu predicts that there'll be a drop in temperature of 0.15 degrees centigrade over that decadal period. Whereas the IPCC predicts that there will be a 0.35 degrees centigrade increase in temperature. Well, let's see who's right. I've got the, the data here. I've put a linear fit to that data, at least so far. And uh, the starts at 0.5, it ends at 0.85. That's an increase in temperature of 0.35 degrees centigrade. So I think you should be laughing at Askasufu and Zarakova rather than laughing at the IPCC because the IPCC got it dead right. So what conclusions can we draw from Zarakova's assertions about a grand solar minimum and a little ice age? Her references to the fact that the more the minimum caused the little ice age are obviously wrong and should be ignored. She then appeals to the bankrupt cosmic ray theory. Failing that, she then uh, appeals to the Akasufu model of uh, future solar activity and uh, global temperatures, which also proves to be wrong, and mocks the IPCC, which was dead right with its answer. So there's no support in her work for an upcoming global solar minimum. There's no link to reduced temperatures on Earth or any other planets. And so I conclude there will be no new little ice age. So if you see somebody touting either a grand solar minimum or a little ice age based on Zarakova's work, please post a link to this video and tell them they're full of nonsense. Until next time, goodbye.